The fourth generation of Scarlet interfaces is here with some nice improvements, but also a controversial change regarding the headphone output. Let's have a look at what you get with the fourth gen 2 i2 and compare it to a few other interfaces. Hey, Julian Kras here, and I already had a look at the 4i4 in a previous video, and now it's time to check out the 2i2. Don't worry, the solo will also come next, so subscribe if you don't want to miss that. But let's stick to the 2i2 for now. FYI, I bought the interface with my own money and despite my red t-shirt, this video is not sponsored in any shape or form. Probably the first thing you notice is that compared to the third generation, the mic inputs are moved to the back. And on the front you now get two quarter inch inputs for Lino instrument connections. I made a little poll on YouTube to see if you prefer the inputs on the front or the back and it seems pretty much tied with a slight preference towards frontal inputs. But yeah, regardless which way manufacturers go, they can't win. What you will also notice is that there's a new set of buttons which let you toggle a few functions like toggling between channels, turning on phantom power, switching to instrument mode, toggling air mode and clip save. The last one we will check out later in more detail and one more note here, I think that Focusrite missed out a bit on a feature and that's the individual phantom power control. Because even though you can toggle between the two channels with the select button, you can only toggle the phantom power for both inputs at the same time. That's a shame. For the inputs you of course get some gain controls which have some nice looking level meters surrounding them. And while this is obviously quite a bit of eye candy, the level meters are actually quite nice and quickly let you check the input levels. The same goes for the output dial, it is surrounded by a level halo. Further to the right you get a direct monitor button. The button only allows you to turn on direct monitoring in mono, where you can hear the left and right input on both sides of your outputs, or stereo, where you hear the left channel on the left and the right one obviously on the right. This can be handy when recording in a stereo setup and the nicer thing is that because the gain on the 2i2 is set digitally, you can even link the channels and then set the exact same amount of gain for both channels, either on the interface or in the software, which we will also have a look at later. And lastly on the front you get a quarter inch headphone output with a dedicated volume dial. Switching to the back you can see the aforementioned XLR inputs. And as this is the two channel interface, they are overwritten by the front inputs, if you plug something into them. Of course, you also get two quarter inch outputs to connect your studio monitors, a high security Kensington locking point and two USB-C connections. The first one is to connect the interface to a PC or a mobile device and the second one can be used to provide additional power if the first connection is not sufficient. In most cases you will be just fine with one connection as it is a USB 2.0 and this has a very high compatibility and this is also the reason why the interface comes with a USB-C to USB type A cable. By the way you can also use the 2i2 in standalone mode with for example just a power bank connected to the power input. You can't record audio this way, but the interface still routes the audio from your inputs to the outputs in real time with direct monitoring. And this way you can use the interface even without a PC. Quick look inside and I'm pleasantly surprised by the additional shielding surrounding the preamp area. Under this sits the that 6261 digitally controlled preamp, which is also needed for the clip safe feature. My awesome patrons also get a look under the shielding and if that's interesting for you, then consider supporting me there. In the 4i4, I was glad to see a new set of converters from the previous generation and I'm happy to say that the same converters are in the 2i2. The analog to digital conversion is done by the CS5381 and for the digital to analog conversion, the 2i2 sports a Cirrus Logic CS43198. These are excellent converters and I'm curious to see how the 2i2 utilizes their specs. All right, time to check out the audio quality. First of all, all audio in this video is of course recorded with the 2i2 4th gen and let's also have a look at some measurements now. The frequency response should be as flat as possible to not color the sound and that looks very good even at the maximum gain setting. There is a minimal amount of roll off in the lower frequencies, but that is inaudible in practice. The response gets even slightly better with lower gain settings, which you often use with condenser microphones. Distortion is also really low. With a typical microphone signal, you can just barely make out some distortions close to clipping, but this is at an inaudible level, so don't worry about that. Dynamic range is the ratio of the loudest signal that the interface can capture and its noise floor. And with a bigger dynamic range, you can leave yourself more headroom without introducing additional noise. Unsurprisingly, the 2i2 comes in with 115.6 dBA, which is the exact same as the 4th gen 4i4, 
and a nice improvement over the previous generation. This is an excellent amount of dynamic range and there are very little situations where you would need more. On the topic of noise, let's talk about preamp noise, which is important when you want to record with dynamic microphones. They typically have a very low output and they need to be amplified a lot, which brings out the noise of the preamp. Here I have a dynamic microphone of the low output variety in form of an SM7B and I wouldn't really recommend this microphone when noise performance is critical, but in this case it's a great example because it is a worst case scenario for the preamp. The mic is directly plugged into the interface and I will let you listen to the noise of this setup. Yeah, that's pretty good. Not the best that I've heard, but definitely right up there in terms of noise performance and my measurements confirm that. The 2i2 comes in at minus 127.4 dBUA weighted, which is arguably a dB worse than the third generation, but it's highly unlikely that you notice this difference in practice and that's the price you pay for digitally controlled preamps. Here is how it compares to a few other interfaces, including the third gen 2i2. One question always comes up and that's if you need a cloud-fed lifter header with the interface. And to that I have to say, probably not worth it in this case. With an additional inline preamp you might be able to improve the noise performance by about 2, maybe 3 dB, but this usually is not needed as the preamp noise on the 2i2 is already very low. Also in terms of gain, the 2i2 has more than enough gain to easily bring even low output mics to a proper recording level. And yes, before you say, but Focusrite states a gain of 69, nice. DB, there is a bit more to it to make gain comparable between different interfaces and I've made a whole video about it if you're interested. Suffice it to say, from a gain perspective, you do not need a fat clouder, but if you wanna eke out the last DB of preamp noise, then that's an option. Of course, we also have to quickly check air mode and I actually just turned it on so you can hear it in the presence mode. You should have heard a change in the sound emphasizing higher frequencies. If we have a look at the frequency response graph with the air mode on, we can see an obvious increase towards the presence range with the highest frequencies being boosted by around 4 decibels. This results in the airy sound of this mode. Switching over to the presence and drive mode, this again significantly changes the sound and you can hear that from my voice. The overall curve gets more V-shaped, which boosts the bass and treble. In addition, the drive adds harmonic distortion to the signal, which you can see in this orange curve here, increasing towards the right. The distortion also gets stronger the closer you are to clipping, which saturates a stronger signal more, and this tries to emulate old analog equipment. Yeah, that's the air mode. It's a quick and easy way to give your recordings a high frequency boost and additional saturation with the presence and drive mode. What I would really like to see is a drive only mode where you just get the saturation without the change of the frequency response. Let's hope Focusrite makes that happen. As usual, the line input performance is very similar to the mic input, so let me just throw a few measurements at your face before carrying on with the output side. The frequency response is nicely flat, all good. The dynamic range is once again excellent with 115 dBA. The distortion performance is quite interesting though, you can see that the distortion rises above minus 10 dBFS. Now, while this could have definitely been done better, I think this hardly matters in practice because you usually leave yourself some headroom anyway and if you record with a typical signal around minus 15 dBFS, then distortions don't even come into play. Not perfect, but also not a big deal and if I hadn't told you, you probably wouldn't have noticed. You're welcome. Let's have a look at the main output side and this is where the Cirrus Logic converter flexes its muscles. Frequency response wise, I don't even have to say anything it's perfectly flat as it should be. Dynamic range is also excellent with about 121 dBA, which pretty much guarantees that you will never hear any noise from the main outputs. On top of that, distortions are so low that I'm having trouble measuring them with my audio analyzer. It's pretty much safe to say that you don't have to worry about any of this. And I consider the main outputs of the 2i2 to be audibly transparent. This means that you only hear the audio that is being played back without any audible noise or distortion. This is exactly what I like to see from an audio interface these days. Big thumbs up from me and hopefully also from you below this video. 
Hopping over to the headphone output and here you can see the performance in my feared headphone comparison table. I guess I have to start removing older interfaces as this gets quite hard to read, but here you can see how the 2i2 compares to other interfaces and the colors give you an indication of the performance. You can see that in a few areas the 2i2 has been improved from the third generation, which is nice to see. Back in my third generation review I was complaining about the relatively high distortion levels and this has been pretty much completely resolved. Distortions are now at a level where I would say that they are not audible anymore. Power is also considerably higher than the third generation, which means that with the 2i2 fourth gen you should be able to drive many popular headphones to loud levels. In terms of noise, the 4th gen is also a slight improvement and with over-ear headphones there should be no chance you hear any noise from the output. Now I guess some people might already be asking, what about the red measurement? Well, it seems you've spotted the controversial change. Yep, output impedance, which seems to be a reoccurring topic. Generally speaking, you want the output impedance to be as low as possible, otherwise there's a chance that your sound gets colored with low impedance headphones. Now, as you can see, 50 ohm is definitely not low and this can result in frequency response deviations. Here's an example. This is the frequency response measured with a 32 ohm dummy load, which actually looks really good. But let's see what happens if you connect a real pair of headphones to the output. Whoops, not so flat anymore. You can see the curves of three different headphones and while with one of the headphones the deviations are relatively small and you likely wouldn't have noticed them, with another one the response is heavily impacted resulting in a 4 dB boost which is plainly audible. And I guess you now understand why a 50 ohm output impedance would be considered controversial. The issue is that not all headphones are impacted equally. Depending on the headphones you use you might be fine or not. There is a very good chance that you buy an audio interface to get the best sound quality possible and strive for a transparent and uncolored sound. But with the high output impedance of the 4th gen 2i2, there is a very high chance that you will end up with a considerable bass bump with low impedance headphones. And in my opinion, this goes against everything an audio interface is designed to do. That also means that if accuracy with headphones is important for you, you should stick to headphones with higher impedances with the 2i2, like 80 ohms and above. With higher impedance headphones, the impact of the high output impedance is lessened and then you need to worry about this less. But it's still not optimal as so many headphones these days are below 80 ohms. Now, why would Focusrite do something like that? Well, building an audio interface is always a compromise and here Focusrite was limited by the power budget and because of that they limited the output power with a high output impedance. I'm not trying to defend Focusrite here, but they had to make a choice. It's not the choice that I would have made though, especially because you see other manufacturers with considerably lower impedances and I mean even the third generation was already quite perfect in this regard. So sadly two steps forwards and one step back for the headphone output. Let's have a look at the software and I have to say it is quite bare bones but I also have to confess that I'm a bit spoiled as I just reviewed the 4i4 and there you had the possibility to create fully custom mixes for the main and headphone output. On the 2i2 you are missing this feature and I think this is a bit unfortunate as you can find this feature on interfaces like for example the Audient ID14 Mark II. I am actually not too sure if Focusrite could add this functionality or if this is a hardware limitation. Check below the video as I will pin a comment if that ever becomes available. Back to the software, here you can set your gain remotely without needing to reach for the dial on the interface. And I would have really liked to see the gain in decibels here to make it more simple to repeatedly set your gain to known levels. Focus right, you know what to do. The auto gain mode records a small sample of your audio and then sets the gain for you. This might be helpful when you're just starting out and you're unsure where to set your gain to. You can also find an inst button to toggle between instrument and line level input and the air mode button which we've already had a look at. Then there's also the clip save button which when enabled can prevent your recordings from clipping. Sadly this does not work like a limiter which could keep your occasional peaks in check but it actually turns down the gain very quickly when there's a peak that tries to clip. After that the gain is not turned back up again so if you have a take where in the middle you have a loud spike then the gain would have been turned down and the recording continued with a lower gain level. Still better than clipping but in my opinion not as good as a proper limiter implementation. 
Just mentioning that ClipSafe and Air Plus Presence are only available at sample rates of 96kHz and below. And lastly, as mentioned on the hardware, Phantom Power can only be toggled for both inputs simultaneously. On the 2i2, the audio for the direct monitoring runs through an AD and DA conversion and this comes with some amount of latency. But I measured this and this is an inaudible amount of delay, so direct monitoring really is real time. Quick look at round trip latency, which is also important to be low to not perceive any delay when monitoring with effects in real time like you would for example do with an Epson. Here the 2i2 performs quite well, although the performance does improve with higher sample rates. So if every millisecond is important for you, I suggest to stick to those. You can also turn off safe mode in the control panel and with that you shave off about one more millisecond at the risk of crackling audio. All right, let's close out this video with a few pros and cons and let's start with the things to consider before buying the 2i2. The software is more on the basic side and does not offer any mixing, routing or audio processing functionalities. The high output impedance kind of forces you to use headphones with a high impedance, let's say 80 ohms and higher, if accurate headphone sound is important for you. And there are no digital in and outputs to extend the number of channels, so this truly is a two channel audio interface. On the plus side, you get additional features like two different air modes and auto gain. The inputs are really quite nice with an excellent audio quality and the main outputs are transparent. The digitally controlled preamps allow you to link the gain of both inputs, which can be really handy for stereo recording and they are also responsible for the new ClipSafe feature. All in all, the 4th Gen 2i2 is a worthy successor to the 3rd generation and it would have been even better with a low headphone output impedance. Alright, that's it for now. Please like, share and subscribe and I will see you all in the next one.